and we as a church have been reading through John's gospel together the last couple of weeks, and you can download that YouVersion app, uh, go to the Book of John website if you want to, uh, and find all the resources, and not only read through John's gospel, uh, but reflect on the truth of the gospel uh, with the songs that Tommy has uh, written for us uh, for each chapter in that gospel. Uh, this coming week, by the way, that we're headed into, we're going to be in John's, John, <laughs> John's, John chapters 10 through 14. Uh, so jump in if you are reading with us, keep on reading. If you haven't started, jump into John chapter 10 uh, this week. By the way, my name's Matt, if you're visiting. Uh, what a pleasure and an honor to have this time uh, with you that you would visit us and be with us like this. Um, we are going to be in that book of John up until April 1st, up till Easter, uh, Easter Sunday. And speaking of Easter, I want to ask you to keep praying for someone who you want to invite to come to Easter with you this year. Uh, in fact, when you came in on your seat, there should have been an envelope. Why don't you grab that envelope? Uh, I was thinking it's kind of funny that we uh, are giving out envelopes on Oscar weekend, but everybody got an envelope tonight, um, and your trophy is in the, no, actually, there's no trophies, but that envelope inside is an invitation to our Easter service. And we handed out the cards, and the cards are great to, to pass out those little cards, but these really give you an opportunity to, to make a personal invitation. And I, what I want you to do is think about the name of the person that this invitation belongs to and write their name on that envelope and give them this, this invitation and let them know you really want them to come to Easter with you uh, this week. And in fact, I want us to pray for God to help us identify the name of the person that you're going to write on that envelope. So just pause with me and let's pray for that. God, you are the inviting one. You, you are the one, your word says that you loved us first. You initiated towards us. And it is only because of that that we know you and can respond to you. You are the inviting one. And I thank you that you invited each of us to know you that you put somebody in our lives along the way that invited us. And thank God for all the people that have been put in our lives to invite us to know God, to put our trust in Jesus, to keep walking in faith. And so, Lord, I pray that tonight that you would bring to mind for each of us, the name of somebody who needs this invitation. It isn't even just from us, Lord. We're going to trust and believe that it is from you as well that we're going to give this invitation to someone who will come to know you more on Easter Sunday. Would you give us that name and would you help us to follow through to hand that invitation to that person? We trust you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You might want to write the name down even right now. If you want to, go ahead, grab a pen and do that or bring it home with you and don't lose it. Put a name on it and give it to somebody, okay? Well, we're in this series, Snapshots of Jesus. And we are looking at stories in the Gospel of John to get a good look at Jesus, to know Him better. You ever had the experience where, where you thought you saw someone that you knew and then you discovered that that was not the person you thought it was? Always an embarrassing and awkward moment, right? I was at a, an event for my kids' school recently and I saw across the playground this man who looked just like my friend and I walked over to him and, and I shouted out his name, Kenny! Kenny! And he didn't respond to me. And in my stubborn ignorance, I said, Kenny. 
and nothing again. And I, I persisted, Kenny. And he turned and said awkwardly, uh, my name's Ray. <clears throat> and suddenly, Ray's face looked nothing like Kenny's face. It was an embarrassing moment. I wish I could tell you that rarely ever happens to me, but it happens. Well, the snapshot of Jesus that we're going to look at today takes place in the middle of a lot of people who aren't seeing Jesus for who he is. People thought they knew him, and they assumed they had him all figured out, but had not really seen Jesus for who he was. And this still happens to Jesus today. People think they know him and have him figured out. He's the most examined figure in all of history, but no two portraits of him look the same. He is the most famous man, arguably, in the world, but the world can't agree on who he was or is. He's the most written about character in literature, but people are still asking questions about him. From the time he was born 2,000 years ago, people have been believing in him or rejecting him, but never has Jesus become uninteresting or irrelevant. Only one man has commanded that kind of attention, stirred that kind of curiosity, and, and, and attracted that kind of exploration, Jesus. Next month, in fact, on Easter Sunday, NBC, some of you might know this, uh, will be airing a live version of the musical Jesus Christ Superstar with John Legend playing Jesus. Well, yeah, I know, I had the same reaction. Interesting. We still want to know who Jesus is. In fact, the, the, the main song in that musical, if you've, if you've ever heard it, the chorus of the main song says, Jesus Christ, superstar, are you who they say you are? The world wonders. Is he a superstar? Is he a teacher? Is he a myth? Is he a wise man? Is he a revolutionary? Is he the son of God? What is he? Who is Jesus? John chapters 7, 8, and 9 are filled with these questions. In fact, if you want to grab your bulletin, you'll see uh, the first few verses printed in your bulletin are just questions, just a few of the questions in chapters 7 and 8 of people asking, who is Jesus? And I want us to get a look at Jesus in a snapshot from chapter 9 tonight. Let me set it up for us. Jesus in chapter 9 has gone to the temple for a festival and everyone there is talking about him. This carpenter's son from a little place called Nazareth has been saying and doing amazing things. Jesus comes from a nowhere town called Nazareth with no impressive credentials to validate him. But Jerusalem's population is swelled to capacity for this festival that is gathering at the temple. And he seems like a nobody, but instead Jesus is the somebody that everybody's talking about. They're saying things like, have you seen Jesus? Have you heard about this guy? I saw him do a miracle. I was there when he fed 5,000 people with a sack lunch. My, my cousin's friend was at a wedding where he turned water to wine. He healed my uncle. Some are saying, my rabbi says he's trouble. Stay away from that guy. They're all talking about Jesus. Nobody is saying that he is a not a big deal. Some are saying he's a good man. Some are saying he's a liar. Some a prophet. Some a madman or worse. But nobody is uninterested in this guy. In fact, do you know that no source written around the time of Christ in or out of the Bible says that he was just an ordinary man? Believers and non-believers alike all say there was something about him. 
Who is Jesus? That's the backdrop of the snapshot we're looking at in John 9. And it's the setting, this setting of curiosity that Jesus is going to show us who he is through the eyes of a blind man. Because when you follow Jesus, you walk by faith and not by sight. You won't recognize Jesus by sight. You won't know Jesus by looking at him. In fact, I think God's timing for Jesus' life and death and resurrection is, is on purpose, that it came in a time in history when we had no photographic technology, no videos of him, no pictures of him. We don't know exactly what he looks like. Actually, last month, another book came out called What Did Jesus Really Look Like? Because people People are still trying to figure that out. But I think God timed it like that because we would be tempted to practice worshiping his image and we'd miss who he is and what he's all about. In this snapshot from John 9, Jesus shows us who he is through the eyes of a blind man. Because when you follow him, you walk by faith and not by sight. And so I want to give us just four glimpses, point out four glimpses of Jesus in chapter 9 and see who he reveals himself to be in this story. First glimpse of Jesus comes in the the beginning of the the readings that you have in your bulletin from John chapter 9. It says this, As Jesus went along, he saw a blind man from birth a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In the first glimpse we get of Jesus through this blind man's eyes, is this, Jesus is the one who can display God's mighty works in our weakness. Jesus is the one who can display God's mighty works in our weakness. Jesus encounters this man. He was born blind. And immediately, his disciples want to know, whose fault is this? Hey, have you ever had a problem that was out of your control? You didn't ask for it. You didn't deserve it. It just, it happened. You hate it as much as anybody, probably more, but you and everyone around you has been looking for someone, something to blame. Have you ever carried a burden that you just had to keep carrying? You had no choice. You had to keep fighting forward and you had to reject all of the blaming around you. Jesus says this man isn't blind because of his mom or his dad or even himself. Nobody caused this. If you're going to blame someone, blame me. It was God's idea to be glorified in this man's blindness. I don't know about you, but that makes me a little uncomfortable. I can have a problem with that because it means that I'm going to have to let God be God and I don't get a say in everything I experience (laughs) but it also means that whatever I'm going through has some potential glory in it whatever you're suffering through has some potential glory in it Jesus is the one who can display God's mighty works in our weaknesses. This man is blind, but in this weakness, Jesus is going to make a scene and show us who he is. You're walking through what you're walking through because God wants to show you who he is. You're carrying the pain you're carrying because through that pain, you're going to see God for who he is. You wouldn't even think to look for God in the way that you know him 
because of the pain that you have gone through. You would never even recognize God the way you know Him now had you never walked through the pain that you're walking through. Jesus says we look at this blind man and we think something bad happened and we miss that God is revealing His goodness through the problem. Jesus says life's not as simple as a karma equation. Cut out the karma talk. It doesn't do you any good. This man is not blind because of sin. He's blind because Jesus is going to use his weakness, his vulnerability, his handicap, his brokenness to show us who he is and what he's all about. This, this makes me think of when I was a kid growing up in Texas, we would buy fireworks for the 4th of July and we would celebrate out in the country where you don't have choreographed professional fireworks performances. You DIY the fireworks. My brothers and I were the show. And, and we would have fun like lighting bottle rockets and throwing them and our dog would try to fetch them and burn his mouth. This is the way I grew up. And, <clears throat> but my favorite fireworks every year were always the Roman candles. Anybody familiar with the Roman candles? And what I loved about the Roman candles is, is you got to hold on to the thing. You know, everything else you lit and you stood back or you lit and you got rid of it as quick as you could. But the Roman candle, you stood there and you held on to it and fire came blowing out of your hand. I don't know how you did it, but we would hold it out and shake it and these bursts of color would come shooting out of this Roman candle. It fascinated me as a kid. And I read the story of Jesus encountering this man born blind and his statement that this is for the glory of God. And I think about my life being a Roman candle in Jesus' hand. He lights me up and he holds me out and my life glorifies him. The stuff in our lives that seems to be the worst of it is just fuel for God's glory to burst out of our lives. Jesus shows us that God can send bursts of light and bursts of glory and bursts of who he is out of my life and out of yours. I don't know what you're going through tonight, but it's possible for God's goodness and greatness to be revealed in whatever you're going through. I don't know what you're blaming yourself for tonight or what others are blaming you for, but Jesus reveals who He is through your weakness. In His hands, your life can be a Roman candle shooting out bursts of His glory. Hold on, Jesus says. This has happened so that the works of God might be displayed in Him. What we see as a problem, God sees as a Roman candle for His glory. This first glimpse of Jesus through this blind man's eyes is Jesus as the one who can display God's mighty works in our weakness. The second glimpse comes in verse 4. It's Jesus speaking and he says, As long as it is today, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming. When no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And the second glimpse of Jesus we get through this blind man's eyes is that Jesus is the one who shines a light in a dark world for us to find our way to God. When was the last time you were in the dark? When was the last time you, you tried to get somewhere or do something in the dark. We're so dependent on the light. During World War II, England was getting blitzed from the air by German bombers. And so the, the British government passed a law, a curfew, that once the sun went down, all lights had to be kept off all night long until the sun came up again. It was the law. You could not 
Turn the lights on. You could not light a cigarette without getting fined during those blackouts so that the German bombers couldn't see their targets. And the British government had these blackouts across the whole country. And there are medical reports of people getting injured because people still tried to get out and go do things in the dark. And there were no street lights. There was no light. So people are walking into street lamps and park benches and moving cars and running into one another. It was chaos because chaos can thrive in the dark. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Earlier, he says to, to the, the crowd, I'm the light of the world, and anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness. Light reveals what is hidden in the dark. Jesus says, follow me, and you'll never walk in darkness. You'll come out of the dark. You'll come out of hiding. You'll be revealed for who you are. You think this man's blind and that's the end of it, but I'm here to show you more. You think he's nothing but a blind uh, beggar, but I'm telling you he's a Roman candle about to explode with God's glory. You see this guy as a nameless blind man, but you don't yet see the mighty works of God that are going to be displayed in his life. This whole whole thing is in the dark until Jesus comes to reveal what's going on. You can't see in the dark what God is up to, but Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, and while I'm here, I'm showing you the works of the Father. In light of Jesus, I know myself in light of Jesus, I know a truer version of me. In light of Jesus, I know my circumstances are more than what they seem. In the light of Jesus, I have hope beyond despair. What seems hopeless has the potential of glory in his light. In his light, I see my need for him. And in his light, I see his grace. In his light, he sees me just the way I am, and I don't have to stay that way. In his light, I see me loved. In his light, I see me in the power of his resurrection. I see me in his freedom. The more I walk by faith, I see the light of Jesus. He shines a light on me, and he shines a light on God so that I can know God so that I can know who he is. Chaos doesn't rule in the light of Jesus. God's mighty works are displayed in the light of Jesus. So it's no surprise that Jesus says all this about light in the midst of people asking, who is he? Who are you, Jesus? Are you a good man? Are you a liar? Are you a prophet? Are you the savior? Are you a maniac? Are you a superstar? Are you a myth? Or are you the son of God come to save us and make us right with God? Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. I'm showing you the works of God. Follow me and you'll never walk in darkness. Through me, you'll know who God is and you'll know the way to life with him. I'll open up your eyes to the glory of God of God and then Jesus does the weirdest thing in the story and that's the third glimpse that we're going to see of who he is in verse 6 after saying this he spit on the ground made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes that's weird <laughs> what's he doing here verse 7 go he told him wash in the pool of Siloam, this word means sent. That's there on purpose. John wants us to know that. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. The third glimpse of Jesus we get through the eyes of this blind man is that Jesus was sent by God to reveal who God is. Listen, he put mud on his eyes and told this man to go. Now, Jesus had healed a lot of blindness. In fact, the most common healing in the New Testament in Jesus' ministry is blind eyes gaining sight. 
But normally, Jesus just, he just speaks something or he touches them with the power of God and they're healed. But here, he puts mud on his eyes and tells the man to walk blindly to a place he can't see. That's strange. But it's a grand illustration of who Jesus is. Get this. Jesus puts mud on this man's most obvious point of weakness and tells the man to go wash his blind eyes in the pool of Siloam, which John wants us to know means scent. Jesus says, go wash yourself in the scent one. One that has been sent will open your eyes. He puts some mud on the man's weakness and says, you need to be washed, but don't go find your own source to wash in. Don't just go wash up in any place. Don't look for healing in the wrong place. Don't look for what only God can do in the wrong place. There is one that is sent for you. Healing has been sent for you. Vision has been sent for you. Glory has been sent for you. Light has been sent for you. Go to the one that has been sent for you and be healed and have your eyes open. It's about Jesus. He's the sent one. He's the sent one by the Father. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God sent by the Father to open our eyes to who God is and to shine light on who God is, to display for us, for me and for you, who God is. The fourth glimpse comes towards the end of the story. And we've got to jump down there. The rest of the story, people are trying to figure out what happened, how it happened, and who is Jesus. In fact, they gather in the synagogue. It's a Jewish community. And back then, they could actually kind of hold court in the synagogue to figure something out that had happened in the community. And so they bring this man in who they knew had been born blind and now could see. They bring him in and they question him. They are desperate to know who Jesus is, but they reject the explanation the blind man gives them. The discussion gets heated and eventually, they throw the man out of the synagogue because they don't like who he is saying Jesus is. And that's when Jesus shows back up in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you've now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Tell me so that I may believe in him. This is the final glimpse of Jesus in this snapshot. Jesus is revealing himself to be the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? It's a strange phrase. It's a phrase that really describes humanity. A human being is a Son of Man. And so why would Jesus point to his humanity instead of his divinity? For all His divine attributes, for all His power and His miracles and His virgin birth and all the God talk and God action, why does Jesus call Himself the Son of Man? Could it be that He delighted in being the Son of Man because He knew what He could accomplish? Could it be that the Son of God delighted in being the Son of Man because He knew that by the Son of God being also the Son of Man, He could reconcile humanity to God? Jesus says, yes, I'm the Son of God. I'm the, I, I am the I am. I'm the Messiah. I'm all those things. I'm the light of the world. And I'm the Son of Man so that I can be what you cannot be. I can do what you cannot do. And I can make you what you cannot make yourself. Jesus is the answer 
to a prayer that is spoken over and over again throughout the Old Testament in many different ways of humanity crying out to God to come and to rescue us. And in Psalm 80, this is how the prayer sounds. Lord, let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the Son of Man you have raised up for yourself. That's Jesus. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, light of the world, that we may be saved. Jesus is an answer to this prayer. Jesus shows us who he is through the eyes of this blind man. And who is he? He is the Son of God sent to be the Son of Man so that we would have light shining in our darkness to reveal who God is. We see all this through the eyes of a man born blind because to follow Jesus is to walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is the only response he's looking for. After all that this man has gone through, receiving his sight, being questioned by his community and thrown out, Jesus asks him this question, do you believe? Lord, I believe. Faith is the only response he's looking for. The greatest temptation of our age is to just call Jesus a great moral teacher and leave it at that. A special person, but nothing more. Jesus Christ, superstar, are you who they say you are? The greatest mistake is to close our eyes to what Jesus did and to close our minds to what God is capable of doing. But by viewing Jesus as barely more than fiction, just better than most men, by viewing Jesus as being on equal footing with others who have achieved greatness, is to not see Jesus. To accept Him as merely a human teacher of religious thought is to remain blind to what He came to reveal And to those who believe, it's so plainly obvious. All I know that blind man said to the community who was questioning him, all I know is that I was blind and now I see he must be from God. It seems so obvious that this man from Nazareth who never traveled more than 100 miles, never wrote a book, never composed music, never had his picture taken, never earned a degree, is yet the Son of God who is the Son of Man and still the greatest hope the world has ever known. And we know him by faith. Tommy, would you come and join me? How are you responding to him tonight are you trusting Jesus to use what you see as a problem as a Roman candle for his glory are you trusting him to shine light on who you really are and who God really is and what God can really do with you Are you trusting Jesus to be the Son of God sent to show us who God is? Are you trusting Him to be the Son of Man who came to reconcile you with God? What have you decided? Jesus Christ, are you who they say you are? Are you like the man who was blind, willing to see that no one has ever done what Jesus did? Will you walk to him with faith? Do you believe, asked Jesus? Lord, I believe. That's the response tonight. Every one of us will decide. Either tonight or at some point, we will decide what we do with him. Do you believe? Lord, I believe. 